Hello, this is Lecture Ten. Today we will continue to discuss the subject of yielding in Chapter Seven. Let me.、Uh, I didn't feel totally comfortable last time. Let me return to to this uh, uh, Worsley problem and, and show you another way to look at it. So we talked about. Whenever you have slip, it's because your WI is larger than one. Yeah. Whenever you have not reached maximum slip, it's when oh gee, it's when the bulk should have a shear rate that's locked in. I use the word locked in. At a level such that this is nothing but W I equals one in the bulk. So, for my discussion, I should be careful of calling this apparent, just as the book says. So we have this. So if you don't like that, basically you have. Uh, uh, I made the argument that uh, oops, that. Uh, uh, In the bulk, the shear rate will be this. As you start to, you will encounter a slip whenever that is possible. And we had this formula. I, I, don't, I want to save time not to derive this for you again. And I, I can claim that this is the. Uh, what I can claim any time you have slip, basically you are locked into a shear rate like this, no matter what is the gap. So, which means when I double my length, double my gap, I should still have the same rate. Therefore, this must be a constant. Therefore, uh, uh, when I when I double h. I must have double B, and that's exactly this expression. So I'm just trying to show you. I don't need the picture to help me with the conclusion. You see my point? Remember, we are trained differently. Our brain works differently. Some like the analytical thing. Some like a graphic thing. I'm just showing you. Gee, how easy it is can it be? As long as I acknowledge when I double my height. I will double my velocity, but the bulk should lock in to the same rate. Therefore, as long as、uh, as long as v over h doesn't change, you can have three, you can have five, you can have anything you want, right? And if this is a constant, it must mean v is proportional to h. Then, if it's n, then it's n. So, okay. So I just want to to get over with this. So, such a simple matter, but the slip uh, is a uh, uh, is a, a topic we must understand deeply for us to move forward with、uh, with、uh, bulk shear. So that's the homework is assigned for you to to learn about how much you have to shear before the bulk start to undergo uh, undergo a, a larger amount of uh, uh, shear than. Than than W I equals one. So now,、uh, with that, I come back to、uh, Chapter Seven. We are uh, uh, we are、uh, going to describe yield in in, in several ways.、Uh, forgive me for being brief. I'm not going to copy the title of the book.、Uh, And we start to talk about a、uh, uh, voluntary yielding or unforced yielding last time, and we even talked about shear thinning. So I'm not going to、uh, say very much、uh, further. We can, uh, you can、uh, read the book, and, 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 and、uh, there is nothing particularly difficult, except even this word. Maybe I'm the one inventing it. I called. 
it, no, remember this is done under condition when the shear is, is, is rather weak. Even in that condition, it is, uh, a, one can still speak about uh, keeping the same concept, uh, uh, which is uh, yield. So it can happen uh, uh, due to diffusion because, uh, because the structure the structure does rearrange through diffusion. So when the structure changes, of course, uh, it's no longer the same structure, so you, you, you of course, have a different state. Okay. Uh, there are many parts I will be brief, so let me uh, talk about uh, section two, which is uh, c concentrating on this overshoot last time I start to, to describe to you in startup shear. So the first few sections of chapter seven will be shear. The uh, last two or, or sections also will be on extension. We'll be very patiently, uh, patiently going through them. And startup shear, of course, uh, is something we have I've said many times, basically, uh, you manage to try to impose a certain velocity as quickly as possible. It's never instant. But as long as the time that it takes is very, you know, is very, very small compared to tau, we call that a startup. Remember, it's never instant. It always takes finite time. And it's all a matter of your instrument's time resolution versus your material's uh, uh, tau. So for water, you probably can never claim you have startup. Because the tau is, is smaller than than the instrument you can uh, apply to. So that's the concept. Uh, with that, you just watch how stress grow changes, right? Uh, uh, so, you know, at this moment, and, and I want to remind you that there is always starting from zero. We call that elastic, and and when the Weissenberg number is large, it tend to have an overshoot like I draw, and I have. Uh, lots of data in the book talking about it. Um, I will not go through too, too much uh, details of this. Uh, this Weisberg larger than one, as you know, that's, uh, that's the time to take to make 100% deformation being much, being smaller than. Um, being, being, uh, uh, being much smaller than, than, than one now. The limit, and um, uh, I, I will not go through the different uh, parts uh, uh, to this. Uh, I already mentioned about this region. When it's larger than one, there are still two regions. One is it's all defined determined by by something called Rolle's uh, uh, relaxation time. So this is something, if you like, you can go very carefully, go to chapter two, there is a discussion about it. Roughly speaking, this Rolle's relaxation time is about, uh, is related to this terminal relaxation time that we can get from South's measurement, typically, remember. Uh, we, can, we can get Basically, it's this number divided by z. Remember, z, I keep telling you, is the number of entanglement chain, so-called. So this much uh, all you need to know. So that, that, um, that Rao's time essentially is a time that this chain Remember, we talk about entanglement that the chains are living in a tube. Rao's time is a time, imagine a uh, tube does nothing to me, what would be the relaxation time I have? So, and sometimes it's, it's called the, the stretching time, but basically it's a, uh, it's a very specific, uh, for a given material, this number is very specific, it's fixed. So there were two regimes. In regime one, 
we uh, not only have wi larger than one, but we have wi smaller than z, roughly. So let me translate that to you. Basically, you have a wi, which is Weissenberg number times thermal relaxation time. I can multiply a tau r and divide a tau r. And I start to define Rao's Weissenberg number as, this is what we use all the time, so let's just call it. It's called Rao's Weissenberg number. Okay, so that's this part. And the other part is like the ratio of this. other part is basically Z, roughly speaking, very roughly speaking, okay? So there is a limit where what I wanted to say, a limit where Rao's Weisberg number is smaller than one, which if you use this definition is exactly this. Uh, the Weisberg number is smaller than z. Remember, z is always a number of entanglement, of course, it's larger than one. So I know I introduced a new concept called Rao's time. That's okay. And Rao's Weisberg number then, of course, is nothing but a uh, Rao's Weissman number, of course, is nothing but the time it takes to make a 100% definition relative to Rao's time, of course. Not the terminal time now. It turns out it's just another time. It's a shorter time. It's a time, imagine all of a sudden you have no tube confinement, no entanglement. What would be the relaxation of that chain? Well, that's the chain actually turns out that chain. I know I skipped a bunch of uh, polymer physics here. It turns out that chain is in an environment where it uh, behaves like a Rouse chain, so-called. A Rouse chain has the feature that R, the relaxation time of a Rouse chain, is proportional to molecular weight squared. So all this is in chapter two. So there's nothing, you know, you can just flip back and go back. We're just introducing a definition. It's a shorter time. It's a time, apparently, it's a time when this is larger than one, you have chain stretching. In other words, chain will start to stretch. Before that, chain only orient without much stretching. I know these concepts are still fairly uh, abstract at this point. It's okay. Uh, uh, but I, I want to throw this language in there, at least. So I'm going to skip much of this region and only talk about region where this is larger than one. You can think about it as wi larger than z. Larger than some number. In that limit, uh, we discovered, uh, well, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I plan to do this, actually. Let me do that. Let me do that to, so that I, I want to show you we are not super smart. Uh, we, we don't really have, uh, we, we don't really have as much appreciation about the overshoot just like none of us had before. But I want to, let me, let me inject this. I know it's, this is something we discussed in chapter nine, but it's really useful for you to, 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 to see it here. So, uh, so coming back to startup here, and uh, as I emphasized before, H in our uh, rheometric lab is typically about a millimeter which is a sizable uh, dimension. It's processing may involve just that kind of dimension. This is uh, eventually in the millimeter range uh, to make our, uh, our garbage bag, that's all in the millimeter range. And it's a millimeter, you have sample between them. Millimeter, really small, OK? 
okay? There is no way for you to tell that when I start with top with velocity v, whether it will be homogeneous or not, okay? So for some reason, hope today we will have a time to cover why we did it. Uh, we suspect that this may not be true, okay? That this uh, top uh, uh, textbook description may not be true. So we, uh, I'm not gonna uh, uh, to go into detail until later. So we decided to de develop a technique to watch what, how the material uh, deforms. So the, this gap, this gap, I know this is, this gap is again millimeter and we peek into it. So we look into the screen and I know, I know this is, uh, This thing has got turned on again. This thing have a way to be turned on automatically, actually. I haven't figured out how. Uh, when I was doing some button, it, it turned, gets turned on. Okay, so here's the movie. So this is the gap of a millimeter. And watch, right? You have nicely sheared, oops. Uh, however you want to call it. I, I'm today free to call it, it, it broke. Something is breaking. And uh, the movie will repeat itself, but uh, so this movie was very valuable for us. Uh, it's a millimeter. If you don't use some magnifying, you know, object, some kind of lens to observe it, or to blow up this millimeter, you won't be able to see it. So you just need a microscope lens to, to observe it. The place it start to break is right, right after the overshoot. Okay. So this failure start to occur just right around here, right after the overshoot. So this just give us all the insight you need to have that something is breaking apart after reaching overshoot, okay? We don't care about what's happening at molecular level. At microscopically, this is what you see. So this is why we start to say, huh, I now know what overshoot means. Structure breaks apart. Now, let me be very clear here. For the Reasons we did this that I will explain. It's a fascinating piece of history. Had we not designed our system, not necessarily for the purpose of observing this, to uh, study something like uh, that you already heard about called war slip. Had we not, remember in war slip, in order to have a big magnitude of war slip, you need a lot of molecular weight, you need sufficient entanglement. A B can be large enough. So we prepared our sample at least re with reasonable B, if you like. If you not, if you prepare a sample less entangled with a smaller B, okay, you will end up having only observe a homogeneous shear. In other words, this is a condition when the entanglement is rather severe. In other words, Z is quite large. If Z is smaller, you will have a boring result. Boring result, where the movie will reveal that nothing is different than what I draw from the top, from textbook. If you have only a movie like that, drawing at the top, homogeneously shared all the time, would you have as much insight about this overshoot point as this movie would tell you? The short answer is no. Although, well, folks, although overshoot is overshoot. And I said overshoot by definition should be called a yield point. It's by definition the termination of elastic response. And how can an elastic response terminate unless you break the elastic structure, 
Okay? So in that sense, in that sense, in retrospect, this overshoot is utterly trivial, its meaning. But we were, not, as I said, we were unprepared. We, we didn't know any of this. Therefore, the movie helped us, if you like. Any question on this point? So that's a little bit of a, 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 a um, motivation. So with that motivation, we realize this overshoot point is a quite special, may have some very uh, special feature, okay? So this overshoot, we sort of call this yield point, may be a point of, of a great significance. So one started to look at when does it occur, for example, what is the stress level, we call it yield stress. What is the time it occurs, we call it yield time. So you have these two coordinates. And moreover, you can draw it differently, the startup. You can draw it as stress, as a function of strength. And again, you have this overshoot finding what is the critical strength or yield strength where this occurs. Okay, this point. And you can go ahead, no slip, okay? You avoided wall slip. In that limit, you go ahead, everything you do is, is bulk response. You find uh, basically that stress uh, at this point for, for different shear rates. So that's what I need to describe for you. Okay, so for example, if you start to really want to understand this point, so you start to look at it at a different shear rate. Okay, and you can look at another shear rate. I know I'm, I, I cannot draw as well as, uh, as the data or book shows. But basically you find that this point of course shifts higher values, okay? And you find basically that as this, as you can see, as this shift to higher value of gamma y, the sigma y also shifts. In fact, they are proportional to each other. And they are all proportional to the applied rate, shear rate to the one third power. So the physicists like to look for scaling. Well, we were, we were just naive. We, we, we find, uh, uh, why not try to see if they have certain scaling. Of course, this uh, rigorously means your WIR is raised to the third power, right? See, as soon as I touch this bottom, I think that that, that, that thing is coming. Any case, uh, and this is this is equation seven point four a, and this is equation seven point five. So just just some facts that I'm offering. Uh, if the scaling is like that, then you may look for a theory that explains such scaling. So that's why it was important at least to uh, understand whether that's true or not. In region, in this region, we, I call it the viscoelastic region. This region, I call it the elastic region. In, in region, uh, in, in the first region, this law is not obeyed. It's less clear. So the rest, I think you can uh, uh, read the book. Basically, for example, uh, that if you if you uh, normalize your data, in this region, you find all, all the curves collapses, all the data collapses into one line. OK? 
okay, this is all described in detail in the book. Uh, in electronic copy, it's actually all in color. Uh, fine. All this is part of uh, chapter 7.2. There are different subsections. I just picked up some, uh, some uh, uh, important ones. And uh, uh, if you like, this is uh, section two. Under the section two, there's uh, section seven. To one, which is about the scaling that I talked about, and uh, and in the uh, in the seven point seven point two point two, uh, I can uh, describe some. Let me just use a different word than in the book. I can describe something about. Meaning of the yield point, which is the nothing but the happening at a definition happening at the, the peak stress. So the meaning of that is perhaps most uh, straightforward to to have that from. Uh, From the book. Instead of me drawing it. Uh, so I skip all the details. The meaning of that is in here. Remember, this is so it's discussed as the evidence of yielding. The meaning of that is you can share your sample, okay? If you share it before reaching the maximum. And then uh, you need a, a particular device to do that. Uh, most of the uh, rheometers, other than TA rheometer, is built that way. It's, it's torque controlled. So you shear your sample, and the machine is built in such a way you can let go of exerting zero torque, so the sample will try to snap back elastic. So this feature, this cartoon is just showing that if you shear it before reaching maximum, and you so-called let go, in other words, you let, instead of fixing your surface, you let it have zero stress, the sample just snaps back. I do it in rotation, but of course you can think in shear, right? In linear shear, you shear to there, you let go, zoom, it comes back. That's before maximum. After maximum, it cannot come back. After maximum, if you shear, it will return to some degree, but it can never return back to original position. So you lose some elastic. You know, it's no longer purely elastic. So that's the bottom line. So, so for that reason, I, it's, it's, even this point is sufficiently persuasive that at least some overall structure uh, retain sufficient integrity that upon unload, meaning upon uh, uh, release the force you apply to it, it can uh, snap back and, and elastically recoil back completely. Whereas uh, after the maximum, it cannot. So this point, I, 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 I think it's, uh, 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 it's, uh, it should be the very uncontroversial, okay? So, but that's, that's all I can offer to you. That's, that's the meaning of it. Uh, I'm going to uh, skip a lot of this uh, unless you have a question. So this, this section two is done. This is all we're going to say about section two. The key uh, part is described here already. So it's, it's really about whether your deformation is recoverable or not, right? Irrecoverable or not. 
depending on depending on whether depending on whether you are past this point or not, right? So this is elastic, and beyond that, you have you may still want to keep it called viscoelastic or whatever you may call it. Or I call it the elastic visto because remember we made the joke that that all viscoelastic should be called elastic visto instead, elasto -vis viscous instead because it started plastic first, right? So that should be all crystal clear, right? And nothing, nothing to sweat over. It's all just uh, simple uh, results. You know, why all this happens, that's a separate story. Whether, uh, it, it, let me just emphasize one more thing, since you already saw the movies. The movie shows that some disaster could happen after the overshoot, okay? But it, it, the movie also by definition gives you the confidence that up to the maximum, nothing happens. Everything is still homogeneous, the shear. And that's, that's important. So that uh, theoretically you will have a, a treatment that the system is, in, is still homogeneous. And nothing surprising, right? Up to this point, the elastic structure is about to break, but of course has no chance to, to break yet. Then of course the deformation should be homogeneous. So it's all logically uh, uh, reasonable. Any questions? Okay, so Let's move on because uh, you know we, we don't have uh, we don't have to waste any time on anything that's simple. So uh, I can very briefly say something about steady state. I will be fairly brief. Uh, the only reason you want to treat steady state is uh, is uh, as I learn rheology. Uh, much of what we discuss is only about steady state. So you may have shear thinning behavior. Why I mean steady state is let's uh, ask ourselves what to learn about reaching steady state at these higher and higher shear rates. Uh, uh, so so the so it turns out, I know, I know I'm drawing linear shear. It turns out steady state, you should th not think about linear shear because you need to shear forever. And the only way you can shear forever is rotational shear. But I want to illustrate the concept the same. So suppose you have a velocity that you impose until steady state. Then you can, on top of it, impose another velocity that's a sine wave. So the idea is that you could, uh, uh, with the steady state as background, impose a oscillatory shear and see, pick up the oscillatory shear response. Just like a small amplitude oscillatory shear. So it turns out you can define uh, G prime, G double prime. So if this is your G prime, G double prime, at zero shear, okay? Then you find, it turns out, uh, when you will have steady state with shear, this G prime, G double prime move to a value lower, or sorry, higher in frequency, lower in, in the power. And how much it shift is directly proportional to the radio plan. The steady state radio apply. Okay. So it teaches you a few things that certainly your chains are moving much faster now. And the reason they are moving faster is because you're dragging them to do so. 
That's why it's proportional. Okay, but a little little bit of confusion when do this experiment trying to avoid and to learn is that the crossing. If you call this crossing G C, this crossing doesn't change. Remember the crossing. Uh, G is basically proportional to the plateau modulus. And plateau modulus, according to uh, our discussion, I, I know I'm ver I was not even able to say very much, uh, but it's covered in book uh, chapter two, is your plateau modulus is directly related to the degree of entanglement. You have. Okay, when you have flow, you supposedly uh, lose entanglement, if you like. In other words, the, the chains are passing by over time, uh, over t the time scale of the shear. But that cannot be understood as this, this entanglement molecular weight start to change, for example, start to increase. In other words, initially you have 10 entanglements don't have time to draw 10 or whatever an entanglement, one, two, three, four, five, six entanglements. After slip, after you reach steady state, you are not you are not supposed to think that you have two entanglements or zero entanglement. Because if you think that way, then the ME will increase. ME increase would mean G decrease. But the G doesn't decrease at all. You remain the same. So the only thing you can learn from this is that it turns out uh, the best way to think about it is a steady state means uh, at certain rate, it means you have no entanglement anymore on the time scale of the shear rate. But if you want to probe this material at a faster rate, you find the entanglement is all there. It's completely uh, uh, the same amount. So this is one way. The other way is you can impose uh, so th this is a, a second one. I think it's a little bit uh, trickier to describe in terms of uh, the amount of time I have. Uh, but basically you can think of it this way that, in, that if you plot the strand as a function of time. So this is one way, okay? This is one way. It's described in here. It's all in. Uh, uh, it's all described in, uh, in uh, under uh, three point uh, seven point three. So I'm not going to uh, save a lot of time. I'm going to save a lot of time not describing details. So that's one way. It's oscillatory. Another way. Uh, it's actually quite uh, instructive. Is you know you have steady shear. Which means your gamma, your shear rate, of, uh, your strength will keep increasing forever, of course. Okay? Reaching steady state already. And then imagine, which means your gamma is linearly changing with uh, time t. But imagine uh, at some point you perform a step strength. You perform a step strength. In other words, you impose a little jump in addition to what is already continuous. So basically, it's running this, and then you give a little more to it. And you can watch how the stress responds to that a little more imposed strength. How much more? It's just this much more, right? Whatever this delta amount. That should produce a little stress response. Remember, it's steady state, so you already have a steady stress. So that little additional strand should produce a, a little additional stress. It's like a step strand, and that stress will decrease over time. And you can watch how that decrease over time changes with the different steady state rate that you use. Yeah, shear rate for a, a quite tiny bit of time. Yeah, a much higher rate. 
But pictorially is what this gamma is. So basically, you're, you're instead of going a certain rate, or some, well, this curve actually, I know you cannot see the curve very well. The curve says everything. The slope is the shear rate. So you're just imposing a higher, much higher shear rate for a very short duration. And watch the stress relaxation. And you find that stress relaxation is independent of temperature. Remember, stress relaxation always, de a typical stress relaxation always depends on temperature. But here, our stress relaxation is determined is determined by how much you are shearing. Not determined by the temperature you have. So that was curious, a, a, a curious result. I think, okay, I think I'm done with this. Uh, I want to get to, we have half an hour. I want to get to the, 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 the other key part of chapter seven which is relates to the history of how we uh, stamped on, on, the, on this topic of nonlinear reality in general. So I'm sketchy here for, uh, uh, for 7.3. Uh, uh, 7.2, I was also somewhat sketchy, but it, uh, I showed you the important part. The scaling is important. And the, uh, if you like, to know a little bit about steady state, steady state insight is important that you can learn from uh, section 7.3. What is uh, not described in terms of, uh, uh, of the interesting part, uh, and it is a key part of, of chapter seven, is really 7.4, okay? So 7.4 occupies a uh, equally important position as the discussion of overshoot and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the meaning of overshoot, which is yield. So this is the part that's uh, uh, most personal to us. We call it entanglement disentanglement transition. So here is all the interesting history. Relates to why we even, uh, you know, as I was, I think I even complained to you why I started my faculty position 31 years ago. I wish I know what is the problem in this field, and solve it right away. I have energy, I have you know, basic understanding, so I, we could have done it. And, and that, that's of course not the case. We, we started to do it only 15 years ago. And it's all because of this topic. And so let me try to explain this uh, very, uh, 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 in some detail. I want you to recall this result. What is this? Can, can anyone tell me? In extrusion? No, the, the, this red line represents what? Who said that? Yeah, stick slip transition, yeah? Yes? Stick, slip, yeah, stick slip transition. I, I know, I, I, know I, I was uh, quite sketchy, to be honest. So we, we, we have uh, quite a few plots, but, but remember, even, even the uh, Bagley I showed you, the, the Russian result, it's all this, right? Uh, I even show you the movie that the, the something, uh, the critical pressure just comes out faster, yeah? And I even told you that this was controversial, whether it's bulk or, or it's interfacial, yeah? So, right? And we were able to determine that it is interfacial. In fact, uh, 
if you use, uh, uh, for example, different diameters, you'll find this jump will be different. If I use three different diameters of the die, I'll get three different magnitude of jump because I call this Q1 versus Q2, because Q1 versus Q2 is eight D max over D. So the smaller the D, the bigger the correction, the bigger the jump. Yeah, by definition, because I have a fixed D max, because I claim, you know, I understand today that the amount of uh, slip is the same independent of diameter. So, so that's the stick slip trend. And pretty clear that we understand there was was there. So then uh, here comes, uh, I think for this recording, maybe I should uh, uh, forgo mentioning the name of my colleague. Uh, perhaps he would be pleased to, for me to mention it, but I will choose not to mention it. Uh, so here's a colleague of mine uh, who was also working on Wasley. Uh, he says, Shi Jing, um, you know, this stick slip transition is uh, symptomatic. It's symptom, it's system dependent. It only occurs in capillary extrusion, the stick slip transition. Okay? Uh, he had the insight that this is something very special. has to do with pressure driven, there's pressure loss, there's a reservoir, there's a compression, decompression, there's everything. But of course, uh, you know today from chapter six, that's not true. We showed, for example, just since this is recorded, so for completeness, we, let me just be uh, very uh, accurate about it. We show, for example, that you could use simple shear. That's in today. That's because you already covered, you already uh, uh, went through uh, chapter six. That in simple shear, there, there is stick slip transition as well. And for melt. And remember, we build a co cylinder to do it, holding the inner cylinder with the outer cylinder fixed and try to do it. We could do it. So it's all in. Uh, figures uh, figures uh, 6.9, 6.10. Yeah, so it can happen. Well, that's in retrospect. That's way after. So we, 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 what, but the, 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 the need to do it is the same. Is because my colleague told me it should not happen in simple shear, okay? Only in this kind of very weird capillary. Uh, if you study conventional rheology, there should be a big part on capillary uh, rheometry. Uh, uh, the barrel is compressing, decompressing, and, and the, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a pressure-driven uh, situation. Whereas simple shear is just simple shear. Theoretically, it's just, of course, I, I hope by now you know stick slip transition always mean that it is stress control. Okay, remember I, I keep I keep telling you in the rate control you have run into the problem of the velocity uh, keeps increasing until you reach maximum uh, slip. Discuss carefully in chapter seven. So, okay, so we we were. I'm convinced that that slip only occurs in uh, capillary. And, you know, we could have done what the book, uh, chapter six told us. This, this is a good way of showing that device, right? So basically it's co-cylinder, except the gap is very thin, not this thick. So you have an inner cylinder and the outer wall close onto a piece of sample. I showed you before, and then you draw the inner, inner, inner rod uh, uh, against the wall with a sample in between, okay? And you find and use a constant force to do it, 
and you find there is a transition. At some point, zoop, this thing just comes out. This inner wall, an inner cylinder. Uh, but that was not the, the chronological steps that we took. I mean, I think that would have already answered our question. But then we wouldn't have uh, uh, stepped on to the rest of the question. The rest of the question has everything to do with the so-called EDT, okay? We call it entanglement, disentanglement transition. So what we did was we are aware that uh, Real monitor cannot handle melt. Okay, this this cold cylinder you have the home make build one to do it. Uh, we didn't have any uh, appreciation of going further. So just with a commercial rheometer that we do have, uh, it cannot handle melts because I mentioned to you uh, once before that uh, the. that the, if you have a cone plate, that the edge tend to misbehave, okay? That's your cone, you rotate. The edge tend to misbehave. It, 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 you cannot make proper measurement. But we can, uh, we also know we can prepare a solution. So for example, if you have a 10% solution, then the modulus, plateau modulus is reduced by this factor. So that's over 100. 0.1 to the 2.3 power is over 100. So you can make your sample much softer so that the commercial rheometer also can handle the torque because its commercial rheometer is only built to handle softer material. Can handle the torque, meanwhile this meniscus part is, is less uh, severe or hardly uh, important. So what, we, uh, so what we did was trying to answer our dear colleagues uh, from somewhere else a question about whether there is a slip. And we know this device, of course, supposedly gives you a simple shield. Um, so, you prepare such a sample, you put in your cone plate, and you have to find a rheometer, as I uh, told you, torque controlled. So it turns out there are uh, any of the non TA rotational rheometer is torque controlled. Only TA has this uh, other uh, more special rheometer. Uh, uh, so when you have this torque control, since torque is uh, giving you a stress to the diameter of the R, so this is all a formula that you can learn from. Uh, I think it was two pi over three, this corner plate uh, in, in chapter three. So if you can control the torque, then you can control the stress. And if you can control the stress, then you can see if you can find, in simple shear, if you can find the SST, stick slip transition. So that was the idea. That was the idea. Um, We're still at the beginning of learning at that point. Uh, for example, you should immediately ask me, you should immediately ask me, hey, the sample you prepared, okay, the sample you prepared, does it have a big uh, extrapolation lens, the maximum extrapolation lens? Because this has a gap on the order of h, do you have the condition where this is larger than one? So you can see a jump, right? 
you can see a jump in your rate, in your apparent rate over the stress. Right? That would be it's a star, it's fine. That would be the scenario. Okay? And this jump, you know, again, I'm just uh, making up the part we, 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 we sort of refund. So for example, this jump is of course nothing but two dx over h, which is a result in chapter six that we, I, I sort of uh, didn't even need to explain to you. Because v is two vs plus h, and therefore, divide by gamma one. Basically you you will be able to uh, you will be able to uh, you'll be able to get this result. So in any case, uh, that was the that was the uh, the starting point. Put a, our sample, we made a sample. We made a sample, we hope to have enough slip so that we can show a stick slip transition. Um, While well, the rest is really history. Uh, the sample we used was polybutadiene. In order to have enough molecular weight, we have molecular weight as high as a million. Uh, we did it at 10% to reduce the stress level. And we also know we don't want to prepare our uh, polystyrene solution with coloring or something that evaporates. Okay? In fact, if we did, it would be a very different result. We know, and we had some prior work, we know why don't we just put it, the solvent why don't we just have the solvent being oligomeric polybutadiene? Okay, it has a molecular weight of 1,000 grams. Okay. That thing would not evaporate, and uh, it would be quite, quite good. So it turns out you make such a solution, 10%, and today you can go ahead, well, not today, even in, in that original paper, you can go ahead and, and uh, that, that, that part I don't think uh, it's easy for me to explain uh, uh, because it's sort of anti my style and habit. We usually uh, uh, design the uh, material first. Um, this is one of the occasions we didn't design. But it turns out that we were capable, even at that time, this is about two, 2003, okay, year 2003. We're capable of evaluating. We're capable of evaluating what is B, max. Well, in other words, we know the formula for B is basically eta divided by solvent viscosity times a entanglement uh, length in the solution. So we know all the parameters. We know the uh, uh, zero shear viscosity. We know the solvent viscosity. We know at ten percent what is the mesh size of a ten percent solution. Okay. So, what? Well, since you know, so you can calculate. What do you find? You find this B is on the order of one millimeter. That's pathetically small. In other words, it's on the order of the H. So, so of course, you, you're not gonna see a big jump, okay? 
by the time the study is finished, of course, this story has completely changed. By the time you present and wish to publish what you observe, the story has completely changed. So maybe this part I could try to save some time by just going to the PPT. Let me see if, uh, if I have it on page 160. Sixty-one. Yeah, I, there was a lot of argument I made here. Okay, so for those uh, who want to know the details, should perhaps uh, read that part. Quite importantly, I will explain why that was all necessary to describe. So, since you are looking for stick-slip transition. Therefore, you will try to carry out your experiment in stress control. And when you stress control, we call that creep. I know I have not introduced that concept until now. It's either rate control shear, which is typically we just call simple shear, but then you can also impose that shear by imposing certain force. Let the sample creep anywhere they want to go, and that's called creep. And that's done in the stress control mode because we want to see a stick slip transition. So there were some discussions here that I'm going to skip. Quite important, actually. At the end of the day, here's the data. That was published. Uh, in fact, that was not the original data, which is all right. There were some data published much earlier. But basically, uh, what was shown was uh, you impose different stress to your sample. You can see at the 1400 particles, the response, see you impose certain force and the sample start to creep. And response is constant at 14. But I would pick up one, let's 18, let's say 1800. It will, uh, shear slowly, and then start to shear faster and faster. Okay, this is plotted as the apparent rate, which is nothing but upper surface divided by h, upper surface velocity divided by h. And they start to climb. Uh, in general, this climb could involve one or two decades. Since our sample has a b rather small, a millimeter, there is no chance for you to see a change of uh, decades. I know this is a plot for steady state shear from at the particular rate, at the particular stress, you watch how the shear rate goes in steady state. Whereas, uh, whereas uh, this information is about watching how the upper surface velocity changes over time. For a given stress. So basically, it changes a lot. What does that mean? I mean, for this moment, I probably should ask you to pause and think about what it means. I'm imposing a constant stress. And this material initially responds respond with a lower speed on the top of the place. And eventually, it starts to increase in speed current rate, B over H. Uh, what does this mean? Well, it so, it so happened at that point, such an experiment was not available in the literature. In other words, we were the first one to have done such a thing. And the motivation for doing such a thing was to look for stick-slip transition. which you will not find because the sample hardly can slip because B is only one millimeter, comparable to, uh, to the gap. Yet you observe your material start to shear more easily because higher rate means 
higher rate means f stress is fixed, right? I know. Now it's convenient to have that pen back, but I don't want to switch back and forth. This is our experiment. We fix our stress. We, we watch, we find our shear rate is climbing up. Therefore, your viscosity is coming down. Yeah? And coming down from the initial value. And the, if viscosity being high is a result of entanglement, which we learned, because uh, uh, eta is uh, something like g tau, and tau goes with the molecular weight to the one third power, that's 3.4. And therefore, we attribute having high viscosity to the action of entanglement. So watching eta going down clearly suggests that you are watching disentanglement. So that was the, 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 the concept, okay? And uh, the only thing left I have to indicate for you is whatever this rise that you see, of the apparent rate, is of course just V, the measurement of V on the top. Okay, and this today I call it EDT could be several decades in magnitude. This correspond to a high viscosity, this correspond to a lower viscosity by, because of this formula, yeah? And we are blame the viscosity as due to entanglement. I know this concept is all kind of fussy because we are talking about steady state. Uh, this is why the steady state concept was important. But in any case, the viscosity drops, so how could that be? At a constant stress, over time. I tell you what was the history. After observing uh, such a, uh, a, a transition and ruling out that this is not due to war slip, which is what we started to look for, which is what motivated us to, to do such experiment. Uh, what's left is something quite uh, interesting, at least for me, uh, I, I'm not going to get into the details of additional theoretical motivations for this, uh, for, this uh, for, for us to pay attention to any additional implications. But let me just uh, carry, you know, uh, bring you to the following point. That, of course, is something anyone who do rheology would appreciate from day one. This creep mode, of course, as I mentioned, is very different and Different is I don't have a better word for it. It's a very different mode than rate controlled mode. It allows the upper surface to attain any velocity this material wish to attain. You are not in control of that. You follow me, right? You are not in control. This is a fundamentally different way of looking at the materials from compared to rate control. Because rate control, by definition, you control it. So, 
And you see gigantic change. The velocity, at least in the final state, Jesus Christ, right? It's a much lower viscosity. The question you naturally ask is the thing that I want to bring you home to now. OK, let me do it. State one, right? That's here. So maybe it's like this. Maybe. I mean, I know what I did. Homogeneous. Yeah? State two. I know I, I don't have uh, a great deal of, uh, uh, I cannot draw two order magnitude here, but pretend this represents a, a large amount of change. So that's state two. Involving shear rate one and shear rate two. Apparent. Should I be careful? In other words, what our instrument can tell you was only just the velocity here, V2 versus velocity here, V1. Yeah? We don't know nothing else. Now, as I said, there were some theoretical speculations about, about what could be interesting to occur, which is non-homogeneous here. So I know what I was thinking at the time. I was thinking that at least for creep mode, in other words, the system is not stuck to a rate as you imposing a shear rate can do. In creep mode, when the upper surface is free to choose any rate it wish, any rate in which, then my hope was it will be homogeneous. In other words, if we are in a rate mode, rate control mode, so you impose certain rate, who knows, the, 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 the you know, the spec, you know, so who knows, things may go, get stuck. Let's say it gets stuck because for some reason. That's because I impose a constant velocity on the top. But if I have my velocity be arbitrary, why not the system choose anywhere to go and become homogeneous? So that was the logic. That was the logic that's get us started of making a movie to see whether it is homogeneous or not. So this is really the, the, mod, the, the, the movie I showed you here. Lord. Almost kind of. The movie I showed you here. in this simple matter was never done because there was no need to do it. Because we assumed it should be homogeneous. And now you can see the logic was all messed up. We're looking for wall slip we didn't find. We find, gee, the system does somehow become much easier to shear. So it must be a sample Comparing from uh, comparing with the, its state in the beginning versus it at the final state at the constant stress, one was easier to shear at the end than before. Um, uh, so this two state. So the question was, when you are at the end here, is it everywhere uniformly easier to shear or not? And the guess was, since the upper velocity is not you imposing, is what the system choose, it seems every layer should choose the same uh, 
state of here, and therefore be uniform. So that was the idea that that in creep you can have homogeneous here. This is the this is the really the, the bottom line. The creep is already producing something unheard of. We call it stick slip trans. Uh, uh, it's like a stick slip transition, except it doesn't happen at the interface, at the surface. It appears to have involved everywhere. In other words, your sample appeared to reach a less entangled state over time. Okay? And the insight was, or the desire, or the assumption was, if it really disentangles, there's no reason it wouldn't disentangle the same at every layer. And if it disentangle the same amount at every layer, of course, then you will have a homogeneous here. And perhaps less can be said if you are in the rate controlled mode. So that was the whole uh, concept. And I know I'm running out of time. When we come back, I would, you know, we jump on to the other topic, but if you, if you don't want me to keep you in suspense, then the short answer is it turns out uh, this, is a good, uh, uh, this is a good way to get started, but it may not be true. In other words, creep may not avoid a shear bandwidth. But this is a good point where it really was uh, giving us the motivation that we should at least take a look in the gap and see uh, this was a ray-controlled uh, ray mode, but uh, one could do a creep control mode to, 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 to interrogate the same thing. And, uh, and the, the short answer is uh, uh, it's, it, the response is much more complicated. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but we had the right question, at least, to ask. Uh -oh, now we had the desire to know whether the homogeneous shear is, uh, is possible or, or is always the case. Okay. Any questions? In, uh, 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 a short answer to you is it is it is not. It turns out the material, the system is still uh, unable to. Uh, uh, it's it going back to the movie. It, it's the, the mother nature is very clever. They are trying to victimize some layers. You see, when I say victimize, they got some layers shared much more, saving the rest from being shared. And the mystery is really the coexistence. In other words, uh, different layers could have different level of entanglement, although they all share the same, they all have the same shear stress. Uh, this mystery, we have no answer today. It, it's just uh, it, it, when you have sufficient entanglement, apparently, uh, we're no longer stuck by this question. Apparently, you could either stay in an entangled state being sheared much slowly or shear much more, become disentangled. And uh, uh, this, it, it, under certain conditions, this two just stuck, meaning they, they, are, they are not able to. Uh, you can see here, of course, the part I want to emphasize is there's no way for all the sample to shear as fast as the top part of the layer because my V is only this small. So this was the insight. When you're in creep mode, why not you just keep increasing your V until it's all home, which is you share a great deal amount. And uh, uh, we'll come back many times to this, why they got stuck uh, in the future. But, but the, 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 the phenomenology is this. So since I have this movie the same, this is uh, in steady state, trying to show in a different sample. Giving infinite amount of time, they still stay stuck. In other words, you could see 
in principle, the system could negotiate, why don't you choose the intermediate share rate, which is V over H? No. Some top layer choose a level much higher than V over H. The bottom layer choose a value much lower than V over H. And uh, uh, even today, we don't have good understanding of why it happens. And therefore, it's not unreasonable for people to ne never assume that this could happen. Okay. It, it's bizarre. It's completely bizarre. Why, why would it do that? It, it's very stable, meaning they stuck into, once they get victimized, it just stay there and sacrifice. Okay. Okay, I better stop here now. <laughs>